We've all grown used to thinking of Earth as the blue planet. And when you look at it from space, it really does look incredibly blue. From the surface of the moon, its beauty is absolutely breathtaking. Even when you're standing on the shore on a clear day, it can be hard to tell where the ocean ends and the sky begins. That's because, in every direction, it's just endless blue, ocean and sky melting into one. Hey there, everyone! But not many people stop and ask the deeper question, why is there so much water in the first place? What made it so that 71% of our planet's surface is covered in oceans and seas? It's not an easy question to answer. But since this is our channel, let's give it our best shot. So let's dive in and find out. The Birth of Water at the Dawn of the Universe You might be wondering, can we really trace today's water all the way back to the very beginning of the universe? But to understand where the water on our planet came from, we actually do have to go all the way back to the moment the universe was born. These days, you could say the universe is absolutely overflowing with water. And that makes perfect sense, considering that the elements that make up water are among the most common in the cosmos. Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe, and oxygen ranks third. To be more precise, hydrogen accounts for about 73.9% of all atoms in the universe, while oxygen makes up around 1%. But right after the Big Bang, the mix of atoms was completely different. During the first few minutes after the Big Bang, a process called primordial nucleosynthesis created mostly hydrogen, up to about 75%, along with helium, up to about 25%, plus trace amounts of deuterium, helium-3, and lithium-7. That meager atomic lineup stuck around until those clouds of hydrogen eventually clumped together and formed the very first stars. And it was those stars that became the true source of oxygen. Though not stars like our own sun, these were the very first supernovae. They appeared several hundred million years after the Big Bang, formed from massive stars far larger than our sun. And for anyone hoping we'll one day make contact with alien life, this next part might be encouraging. Because oxygen, a key ingredient for life, had already been around for over 13 billion years, meaning the chances of life forming in other parts of the universe are actually pretty high. This is on a totally different scale than the oxygen that began forming on Earth just 2.4 billion years ago, thanks to photosynthesis by cyanobacteria. Some scientists even believe that in the early universe, there may have been way more water than there is now, possibly several times more. But it's likely that most of that water was eventually broken back down into individual atoms as the universe continued to evolve. Where Water Is Hiding in the Solar System there's actually more than enough water in our solar system, but it's scattered in a wildly uneven way. Believe it or not, even the sun is thought to contain a surprising amount of water. In the cooler regions known as sunspots, about 2700 degrees Fahrenheit cooler than the sun's surface, water gathers in the form of vapor. Water can also be found on various planets. In fact, some celestial bodies may actually hold more water than Earth does. Up until recently, it was believed that the largest reservoirs of water were hidden in the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, especially Jupiter's sixth moon, Europa. About the same size as our moon, Europa has an icy surface that conceals a massive underground ocean. And the thing is, Europa isn't even that unique in this regard. Other Jovian moons, like Ganymede and Callisto, are basically huge blocks of ice too. Saturn's moons, like Titan, Tethys, Enceladus, and Janus are no slouches either when it comes to water content. Uranus and Neptune's moons also contain large amounts of frozen water. But when it comes to full-fledged planets, Neptune holds the record for having the most water of all. Fitting, really, for a planet named after the Roman god of the sea. That said, the water inside Neptune exists in a highly unusual and extremely dense state. Some scientists believe Neptune's ice may take on at least 20 different high-temperature forms. The idea of liquid water existing near the blazing hot cores of planets might sound like pure science fiction, 
but scientists have already created mathematical models to describe exactly that. And then there's the Cupier Belt, the icy outer ridge of the solar system, which is also considered a massive water reservoir. This belt is made up of frozen chunks, the largest being Pluto, which, back when it was still classified as the ninth planet, was found to be roughly 30% ice by mass. These objects are essentially leftovers from the formation of the solar system itself. Even farther out lies the Oort cloud, the most distant confirmed storage site of water in our solar system. Scientists now believe that most comets come from this vast region. As you might know, around 80% of a comet's mass is made up of water. So it's entirely possible that the Oort cloud was the main source of the water we have on Earth today. Of course, that's just one of many competing theories, most of which fall into two major camps, the external origin theory and the internal origin theory. The external origin theory The idea that Earth's water came from space might actually be easier to picture than the alternative. After all, when the Earth was forming, it was a scorching hot ball of molten rock, not the kind of place that could hang on to liquid water. Back then, the solar system was a chaotic zone full of massive collisions between celestial bodies, releasing tremendous amounts of energy. So, in such a hostile environment, it makes more sense to think that water came later, delivered from cooler regions farther out in space. On the young, superheated Earth, any water that did appear would have instantly evaporated. And since there was no atmosphere yet, there was nothing to trap that vapor either. Even if some minerals had managed to release water, it would have been short-lived, quickly lost to space. And if by some miracle water had started to gather, it almost certainly would have been wiped out during the massive collision with Thea. Thea is the name of a hypothetical planet about the size of Mars that is believed to have slammed into Earth around 4.5 billion years ago. That catastrophic impact is also thought to be what gave birth to our moon. So, if Earth's water came from somewhere else, it likely hitched a ride on comets or asteroids from the outer solar system, two to three times farther from the Sun than Earth is. The engine that helped deliver those icy bodies to us was none other than Jupiter, the solar system's biggest planet. During the early days of the solar system, an era known as the planetary migration phase, Jupiter's massive gravity pulled asteroids inward and sent them on paths towards the inner planets. Comets, on the other hand, followed long, stretched-out elliptical orbits, making their way to Earth from places like the Cupier Belt and the Oort Cloud. Even though comet impacts were less frequent than asteroid strikes, they packed way more ice, and could have done an even better job hydrating Earth's parched surface. Meanwhile, young Earth, still without an atmosphere, was bombarded again and again by incoming asteroids. This stretch of time is called the Late Heavy Bombardment Period. But how often it happened, how long it lasted, and whether it was a single event or a series of smaller ones, those questions are still very much up in the air. What we do know for sure is that Earth went through a period of intense, repeated collisions. Just look at the Moon. It is covered in countless impact scars of all shapes and sizes. When icy comets or asteroids struck Earth, much of their ice would have vaporized on impact. Some of that vapor escaped back into space, some got trapped in Earth's early atmosphere and some even seeped deep into the planet itself. One of the strongest potential clues supporting the external origin theory comes from comparing isotopes in water from Earth and space rocks. Specifically, scientists look at the ratio of heavy hydrogen deuterium, to regular hydrogen. Deuterium is a hydrogen isotope with an atomic mass of two, made up of one proton and one neutron. If the external origin theory is right, then water from asteroids should have the same isotope ratio as the water in Earth's oceans. Researchers have studied this using both indirect geophysical methods and direct data from spacecraft. For example, in 1986, a probe called Giotto flew out to study Halley's Comet. But what they found was a shock for those supporting the external origin theory. Halley's Comet had nearly twice as much deuterium as Earth's oceans. Later studies of five other comets, like Hale-Bopp and Hyakotake, produced similar results. So does that mean the theory is wrong? Not necessarily. In 2010, the Herschel Space Observatory studied Comet Hartley 2, and this time its water had exactly the same isotope ratio as Earth's. 
Interestingly, all six of the earlier comets came from the Oort cloud, while Hartley 2 came from the Cupier belt. So, could it be that the Cupier belt, not the Oort cloud, was the real source of Earth's water? Still, not everyone's convinced. Some scientists continue to argue that the Earth's water might have formed deep within the planet itself. The Internal Origin Theory There's a major flaw in the external origin theory that we just can't ignore. It struggles to explain not only the sheer amount of water in Earth's hydrosphere, but especially the vast quantities hidden deep in the lithosphere and mantle. That's why more and more scientists now believe that comets and asteroids may have delivered at most about 10% of Earth's total water. One key reason this theory has been questioned is the discovery of ancient traces of water trapped in minerals like zircon. If Earth was bombarded with water-rich space rocks during the late heavy bombardment between 4.2 and 3.8 billion years ago, then how do we explain water found in zircon that's 4.45 billion years old? How could water have been locked into minerals before those impacts even began? And what's more, some studies suggest that life may have existed as early as 4.28 billion years ago, even before that bombardment phase. That would mean water was already here, providing the essential conditions needed for life to emerge. And this isn't the only evidence pointing to ancient water on Earth. For example, when scientists analyzed the helium isotope composition of water trapped in Earth's basalt, they found it almost perfectly matched the makeup of the primordial gas cloud that formed the solar system. Tests of lead isotopes in water molecules also dated them to around 4.45 billion years old. Some mathematical models of Earth's formation suggest that water was added to the planet in varying amounts at different stages of its growth. Based on those models, the amount of water on Earth might actually be three times more than what we see on the surface in oceans and rivers. That means only about one-third of Earth's water is above ground, the rest is buried deep below. And we've even found direct evidence that water exists in Earth's mantle. In 2014, scientists studied a diamond found in Brazil that contained a mineral called ringwoodite. Ringwoodite is a high-pressure form of olivine and had previously only been found in meteorites. What makes ringwoodite so special is that it can hold up to 1% of its weight in water. Even more fascinating is that this blue diamond, as it's called, is thought to have formed roughly 410 miles below the surface, in the mantle. So, if the rest of the mantle holds water in similar amounts, that supports the model's conclusion. Earth may have three times more water than what we see in all its oceans combined. In the end, the truth about Earth's water probably lies somewhere between the external and internal origin theories. Most likely, only a small portion of water came from space, while the bulk of it formed naturally during the early stages of the solar system. And given how much water exists in the universe, the odds are pretty good that life has taken root on other planets too. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and share it on your favorite social media. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, take care and goodbye.